Hello, everybody. My name is Kilian. I'm a PhD student at the Water Research Laboratory at UNSW Sydney. And uh, I'd like to thank Josie for inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, so today I'll be presenting a set of tools uh, to extract shorelines from a publicly available satellite imagery. And the main tool is called COSAT and is an open source toolbox that everybody can use. So I'll go through how the toolbox uh, works and also provide some example applications. So uh, first, before we start, um, this was a, obviously a team effort to develop this toolbox. And so here's uh, all the team. So Kristen, Mitch, Ian, uh, Josh, and Andrew. Okay, so in, in this toolbox, we'll be using Earth observation satellites and only the ones that are publicly available. So I'd like to first show you um, in which orbit these satellites are and how we can use them. So this, this website, uh, Stuff in Space, is really amazing. And you can see all the orbits of all the satellites that are currently orbiting the Earth uh, in real time and where the satellites are. So if we zoom out, uh, you can see there, there's a number of different orbits into which satellites are launched. And the ones that we're interested in are really close to the Earth. So for example, the Landsat series, and they all, all have heard about uh, Landsat. So it's the USGS um, observation satellite. So for example, Landsat 8 is uh, currently over Madagascar and it's about 700 kilometers above the Earth. And its orbit is quite special because it's always um, taking images at 10 a.m. local time. And this was designed like this because it's the best time to take an image in terms of uh, moisture content and other and lighting conditions. So every single image that you will have from Landsat 8, 7, 5, or even Sentinel-2 uh, will be taken around 10 a.m. local time. So uh, this is a, um, a summary of the different optical imaging satellite constellations that are out there. So on the top panel, we have the publicly available images, which are the ones that we'll be focusing on here. So it all started with Landsat 1 in the early 70s, but Landsat 1 to Landsat 3, the resolution is 80 meters per pixel. So that's two cores uh, for coastal applications. But then uh, from the mid, from the early 80s, uh, we have uh, Landsat 4 and 5, which now have 30 meters per pixel at 16 days revisit period. And then Landsat 7. Um, and then we'll also be using Landsat 8 and Sentinel 2. We won't be using Aster because this satellite uh, was its task. So it was, uh, its mission was to capture a natural um, and natural events such as volcanic eruptions, uh, earthquakes, etc. So that's the four missions that we're going to be using in COSAT. Uh, the rest of the satellites that I have here are commercial. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that the resolution is much higher. So we have one meter per pixel for the SkySat Planet Labs constellation, for example. So the main motivation for this work um, is data scarcity. So here I have a, a time series of shoreline change of the 0 0.7 meter contour at Narabin Collaroy in Sydney. And this monitoring program was started by Professor Andy Short in the late 70s, and it's still continued now by our team. So this is our colleague, Josh Simmons. So, um, these time series are extremely useful for a range of coastal uh, application and coastal management, but unfortunately, they're also extremely rare. So the idea was um, to use those 30 plus years of um, satellite data that we have that are publicly available and try to get the best shoreline time series out of it and see how they compare to the in situ uh, surveys. So I'll run through very quickly uh, how the algorithm works. So this is an RGB 
10 meter per pixel image of um, Narabin uh, taken by Sentinel-2. And the first step uh, is to classify the image. So we'll use a classifier to find which pixels are sand, uh, white water, or water. Then um, we'll calculate um, what, what we call the modified normalized different water index, which is just the difference between the short wave infrared and the green. Uh, and it's a very useful uh, index to differentiate uh, water bodies from land features, as you can see here. Now, once we have these two, so the classified image and the water index, we're gonna look at the distributions of each class that we've labeled here in the water index. So on the x-axis here, we have the water index intensity, and then I've, class, I've put together all the different classes. And uh, the sand class here, very narrow distribution uh, in positive values. The water class in blue has very narrow distribution as well, but in negative values. And then the white water class in green here has a very broad range of values and very wide distribution. And that's the same for the other land features, which are uh, the roads, buildings, vegetation here. So um, our algorithm will find the threshold that um, best differentiates the sun distribution from the water distribution, ignoring the other two classes. And then we'll use that threshold, which is about minus 0 0.1, to map that contour onto the MMDWI image. So that's what we're mapping here. And that's going to be uh, our uh, detected shoreline. So we can automate this, pro this process and we can run it uh, across the entire archive of publicly available images of uh, Narabin. So it's very important to identify the white water as uh, it will cause some offshore biases if, if we're not uh, excluding it, because it's also quite reflective, uh, like the sun. So the output uh, of COSAT is a, a GeoJSON with the shorelines that you can uh, put, plug into a GIS uh, workflow, or you can also use the COSAT built-in function to look at the time series. And so you can set some transects and extract time series of shoreline change along those transects. Now, one thing uh, to take into account here is that each image is taken at a different stage of the tide. So we need to tidally correct those time series. So to tidally correct the time series, uh, we're gonna go through the uh, tide levels at, at our site and um, take the tide level for each image acquisition and then we're gonna take those water levels and divide by the beach slope, and that's our horizontal correction and add this to the time series of shoreline change along the transects. So we apply the tile correction on transect base, not to the entire shoreline. So now we can check how it compares uh, against our ground truth. So here are the th last 34 years of shoreline change Narabin from uh, satellite data. You can see that it's doing a very good job at capturing those interannual uh, signals, as well as some of the very uh, strong storm events that we've had, like the 2016 storm. Uh, root mean squared error here was 8.2 meters, but keep in mind that the, the algorithm was developed at this site, so it's, it's gonna be the site where it performs best. So we did some validation at other sites where there was also long-term um, in-situ monitoring programs. And, um, and we quantified um, the horizontal accuracy of the technique and root mean square was between eight and 13 meters depending on the site. And a big limitation uh, for sites with a large side range was the following. So here I have Truc Vert in France. So spring tidal range is about four meters. And if I take a high tide image, we're able to map uh, the shoreline pretty well. Now, if we take a low tide image, um, Trugver has very complex intertidal zones, so intertidal bars and intertidal shoals. So 
the, the actual shoreline that's been mapped at low tide, it's not a good indicator of the, the real position of the shoreline. So that's, that's a clear issue that may also um, arise in the UK, wave-dominated beaches. And uh, one of the solutions is to just discard all the low tide images and only map shorelines at high tide, but we're decimating uh, the temporal resolution uh, in this way. Um, another limitation is that we need water levels and a, an estimate of the beach slope along the, tr the transects. And we'll see how we can get that beach slope uh, remotely as well. Uh, then we're mapping an instantaneous shoreline, so it's subject to, um, to localized water levels and runoff. And finally, uh, accurately georeferenced ge Landsat and Sentinel-2 images are not available everywhere. So re remote Pacific islands, for example, have very low coverage as well as high latitudes. Um, so now I'll go through a few applications of this tool and how we've been using it uh, for coastal engineering problems. So beach rotation is a very interesting um, process that um, we see a lot in New South Wales because we have a lot of embayed beaches. So for example, this is Moruya, uh, 300 kilometers south of Sydney, and we can see it. In April 2013, it was completely uh, anti-clockwise rotated. And then three years later, uh, it's uh, clockwise rotated. So we, we can calculate what we call the beach orientation index, which is whether it's more clockwise or anti-clockwise with respect to the long-term average. So here we've calculated it using satellite data in orange and then using uh, in situ data that was surveyed by Professor Andy Short over the last 10 years. And we see that both uh, match pretty well. Uh, we can do the same thing at Narrabeen, where we have uh, much more data. And uh, we see here that over the last 10 years, both beaches have been uh, synchronized. So we can see here they're both um, clockwise rotated, and then here they're, all, they're both anti-clockwise rotated. But now with the satellite data, we can extend the Moruya data set and add 20 years of data. And um, it was very interesting to extend this data set because we, we discovered that, okay, most of the time they're in phase, but there's also some uh, periods where they were out of phase, like in the mid nineties, for example, uh, they're both beaches are completely out of phase, which was a very interesting uh, point. We can use uh, the satellite data to extend some of the in situ survey programs and go back uh, to the mid 80s. Another interesting application uh, is beach nourishments and how they uh, perform over time. So, this is St. Pete Beach um, in Florida, in the Gulf of Mexico. As you can see, uh, it's heavily nourished. So, we put a transect through the northern end of the beach where the nourishment happens, and then look at the time series of shoreline change over the last 30 years. And we can see about eight nourishment programs and how long it takes for the beach to go back to the pre-nourished state and what's the long-term trend, including the nourishment at this site. Another application is river mouth opening and closing. So as you can see on this animation, uh, we're able to track the location of the river mouth and whether it's open or closed. And so this is the Tijuana river mouth, uh, just at the border with Mexico in Southern California. And uh, from this animation, you can see how the, the location of the opening has been translating towards the south uh, over time. So it started about here, now it's slowly um, migrating towards the south. Uh, here's another application. Uh, this work was done by Michael Cutler from University of Western Australia. 
and he used CoSAT to look at the planform dynamics um, along some of the um, uh, small sand islands that are in Western Australia. And so he modified COSAT uh, to be able to extract uh, island area, for example, or island uh, orientation. And he did some very interesting work looking at uh, the effect of wave climate and water levels on the island platform. And he made his own um, repository called COSAT.islands that you can check on GitHub as well. So another application um, that we've recently been working on is to estimate the beach slope from the satellite derived shorelines and a global tide model. And so he, this site is a cable beach in Western Australia and spring style range here is eight meters. And so you can see how the, the shoreline position is really influenced by the tidal stage. And so if we put a transect down here, we look at the time series, um, we mo what we see here is the tidal excursion signal. Now, if, if we can see the tidal excursion signal and uh, we know the water levels at which each image was taken, uh, we can come with a way of estimating the beach flow. So in this case, the beach flow was surveyed by Andy Short and Herod Maslink as well, and it's about 0 0.02. And so if you use that slope to tell correct those shoreline, you get a way more uh, insightful uh, time series where we can see some of the seasonality. Um, the problem is that a lot of sites across the world, we don't know the beach slope, so um, we don't have a way to, to tidally correct our satellite-derived time, time series. So I'll go very briefly through the algorithm that we developed to estimate beach slope. So these are the raw time series of shoreline change. So they're the same that I showed you for Cable Beach. And these are the corresponding water levels uh, from a global tide model, like FES 2014, for example then uh, we can apply a tidal correction um, with a range of different beach slopes. So let's say from 0 0.01 completely flat to very steep 0 0.2 slope. And then uh, from the water levels, we can, from the tide levels, um, we can identify the frequency at which the tidal energy is maximum. So this is in frequency domain now. And uh, the next step is to um, take the time series of shoreline sh change that have been tidal corrected and convert them to frequency domain as well. And we do this with the long scale transform. Uh, and so from the power spectrum density here, we can look at what's happening inside that frequency band that we isolated. And we see that the the energy at this frequency is modulated by the slope that we're using for tidal correction. So there is one slope that when used for tidal correction completely uh, removes the tidal excursion signal from the time series. And that's, uh, for us, that's the best estimate of the slope at that site. So in this case, 0 0.025 completely suppresses the energy at this uh, frequency. So the algorithm is uh, just calculating the integral inside this frequency band and looking at the slope that minimizes the energy there. So now this allows us to um, map the beach slope across large spatial scales. So for example, here we did the southeast of Australia and the Californian coast. So around 800 sandy beaches to 20,000 uh, cross-shore transects, 100 meters spaced. And we could look at the distributions uh, of the beach slopes. So in this case, they're both around 0 0.06. And this data is um, freely available um, at cosa.dorl.unisw.edu.au. I'll just show you briefly how this website uh, works. So we have the beach slope data for both coastline and you can also look at the time series uh, of shoreline change. So if we go to a beach here in Sydney, um, 
we can click show transects and then the transects show up and each transect has, has a different uh, bit slope. So we can look at the bit slope along each transect and then by clicking on one of the transects, um, we can look at the time series of shoreline change along that transect. So for example, that's the northern end of Narabin. And we can download the data uh, here on the right hand uh, tab. So finally, I'd like to conclude with a list of the different uh, open source resources that we've been developing. So the main toolbox is COSAT and it's on GitHub. And this allows you to extract uh, satellite derived shorelines from uh, publicly available satellite imagery, uh, Landsat and Sentinel-2. Then uh, there is COSAT.slow, which takes the satellite derived shorelines and a uh, global tide model and uh, can estimate the beach slope. And then there's the COSAT website where you can visualize the beach slope data and also the shoreline change data. So uh, all these resources are available online and uh, each of the GitHub uh, pages have, has a forum. So if you're trying it at your own site and have any questions, you can post in the forums and myself or other people in the community will answer and share tips So that's all for my presentation. Uh, happy shoreline mapping, everybody. Uh, thank you very much.